All right, so good evening. Welcome to Joe Bagley, Hiding in Plain Sight, researching Boston's oldest buildings. This is the third digital speaker series event produced by Old North Church and Historic Site. I am absolutely delighted to welcome all of you here this evening. My name is Erin wetterbrook Yaskaitis, and I'm the co-director of education for Old North, where I oversee programs, exhibitions, and visitor engagement. As we all know, our world has changed significantly over the past few months, and each new day seems to bring a new set of challenges. Um, so much feels out of our control at this time that I find it helpful uh, and productive to concentrate on the things that I can do uh, and find areas where I do have power. So here at Old North, we're reimagining our programming for the rest of the year and connecting our monthly topics and content to reflect our passion for active citizenship. Each program will offer action steps to help you become more involved within your community and beyond. But don't worry, it's not all work. We'll also bring the fun through conversations with fascinating experts like Joe, new mini courses, videos, and more. This month, we're focusing on archeology, span or as we like to describe it, the study of digging up stuff. Um, as you consider how the field of archeology span and our planet inform us about our human history, Think about the effects of people and our lifestyle choices. Everything we leave behind tells a story to future archeologists, ethnologists, and historians. So our challenge to you this month, treat the earth kindly. Reduce, reuse, recycle, and compost. These actions can become habits and extend well beyond this month. I am putting a link in the chat box that is from the city of Boston that's like a how-to document. And on behalf of Old North, I want to thank all of you sincerely for your donations, large and small, as you registered for this program. This kind of work is made possible by the generosity of our community and participants like you, so thank you. I hope you'll join us for more programs throughout the year. Um, and if you're not already on our uh, newsletter list and following our social media channels, um, please do so. That's where we announce future events, opportunities, and resources. Um, if you're in the giving spirit tonight, I would like to ask you to contribute to our emergency relief fund. That link is also in the chat box. It's just oldnorth.com forward slash give. Again, we're grateful for the support of our community and we plan to serve you in all the ways that we possibly can um, during our closure and of course, once we reopen as well. Now we'll just go over some, um, some brief uh, Zoom basics. Now, many of us are already familiar with Zoom as we've been watching digital content and attending meetings on it, but just as a reminder, um, you're already all muted, um, so thank you for that. I do have the power to mute you if you accidentally become unmuted while Joe is speaking. Um, the chat box is, is open and available throughout the lecture. So if you think of a question for Joe while he's presenting, please go ahead and put it into the chat box and I'll be monitoring that as they come in um, so that I can consolidate the questions. Um, you can change the view. If for some reason you are in gallery view currently, you can change it to speaker view so that whoever is speaking um, takes up the, the bulk of the screen. And then Joe will be sharing his screen so that you can see his presentation um, for, the, for the bulk of his talk. Now, many of you may already know or recognize tonight's speaker. Uh, Joe Bagley is a well-known, well-followed, and well-loved personality in Boston. He is Boston city archeologist and historic preservationist. He has worked for multiple state historic preservation offices, including the Massachusetts Historical Commission and Maine Historic Preservation Commission. He is currently on the staff of the Boston Landmarks Commission in the City of Boston's Environment Department. In 2016, Joe released his award-winning A History of Boston and 50 Artifacts, and will be publishing his second book, which is the subject of tonight's talk, Boston's Oldest Buildings and Where to Find Them, in spring of 2021. Joe is a passionate speaker, a skilled and inquisitive archaeologist, and a great friend to Old North. Please join me in welcoming Joe Badley. Hi everyone, um, so thank you for um, Aaron for inviting me to give this uh, talk tonight. I'm flattered to be invited and uh, thank you for choosing archaeology for the theme of the talks and the events around this month. Um, so uh, this is a little outside of my normal wheelhouse, but um, as far as the topic goes, I'm going to bring up my presentation right now. And All right. 
There we go. Okay. So you may or may not recognize some of the buildings around my title. Um, if you haven't, if you don't know what they are, then please look for the book in the spring because I'll be talking about every one of the buildings on the screen right now and many more. Um, but we'll be focusing most of the talk today on a, one specific building. Um, so the book is going to be coming out in the spring of 2021. Uh, this is a very, very preemptive talk on the topic. So um, trying out some things about how, uh, how we did the research. Um, and Brandeis University is, is, uh, has selected the book and we're going to be publishing it in the spring. I'm actually working on it still right now. It's been uh, around our third draft and it's heading out to copy type or typesetting um, very shortly. So it's right on schedule to release in the spring. Um, it's been a work in progress since about 2015. Um, which has been uh, quite a bit of work to go into this um, moving forward. So why me? Um, when I wrote the first book, it was really all about archaeology and what we find out about uh, the past through the, through the stuff that we find up in the ground. But the lead up to all of our digs always involves uh, extensive research on the, the history of the properties that we're digging. So before we set foot on the ground, I have to figure out the history of who's been there uh, going back to the glacial uh, last ice age. So all the native presence, um, but then we do a full deed research, tax research, uh, probate research, everything you can think of that I'm going to talk about this evening on each of these houses. So this has been very much a thing that I've done for many properties, including the Clough House, which makes it to the list, which is on the Old North property. It is number, it is number six in the 50 oldest buildings. Um, and uh, so this has really been something that I've been doing for years. Uh, but then uh, realizing that there wasn't a book out there on the oldest buildings in Boston, which was kind of a shock to me. Um, I decided to try to write it and uh, Brandeis University uh, decided to publish it and here we are now. Um, and so this book will be coming out in about a year and it will feature the 50 oldest buildings in the city of Boston. Um, tonight, I'm gonna talk about all the different ways that I've, I, all the different techniques that I've used to, to determine the history of these properties. Um, we're gonna focus on the, the 36, 36th oldest building in the, uh, in the book, the Elijah Jones House which is located at Three Marcy Road. I think you guys can see my mouse. I'm gonna show you down at the bottom where the Three Marcy Road is at the very Southern tip of the city, right in basically downtown Mattapan, um, right on the outskirts of the city. Um, and this is the building we're gonna, we're gonna use this building as a lens through which we're gonna look at all the different types of research that's been done. Um, so the point of the talk today is to really talk about how you can do research like I did for this book on any other property that you may be interested, specifically in Boston. But a lot of the techniques I'm going to show you today are going to have, um, you can do it for most of the city, um, or most of the state even. Um, so, so step one, the first thing you have to do when you're going to research an old building is you have to gather all of the existing data. So the two main, uh, the three main places that we're going to start with this morning or this evening is uh, MACRIS, Map Junction, and Atlascope. Um, and our goals in this step is to really decide what we, already, what we already know about a property and then work from known to unknown. If you're doing building research, you always have to work from some starting point. And that may be the fact that you know the address and that's a good starting point. Uh, but from that point, you have to go into the unknown, but you always have to have a basis, a starting point. So the very first thing that I do is I go to Macris and a lot of the websites I'm gonna show, well, everything I'm showing you this evening is a free resource. First of all, um, I'm going to put the website at the top of the page as I'm showing it to you. But um, because we have to get through a lot of data, the website might go by pretty fast. So um, after this meeting, Aaron will be sending out links to these different resources that I'm sharing with you this evening. Um, and then if you rewatch the video, you'll be able to hear me talk more about it in case we go a little fast this evening. But um, you can also ask questions at the end too about how we did things. So. MACRIS is the Massachusetts Cultural Resource Information System. If you go to the website, it looks like this. You type in a street name or an address. It's a little clunky. It's a little bit hard to use, but it's also statewide. So that's a very good part of this is that it's not just for Boston and it's free. What I actually recommend that you use instead of MACRIS, the website is MACRIS Maps, the website, which is a map based version of MACRIS where you can actually go to a place in any uh, part of the state and see what places have already been inventoried. Um, this is the three Marcy Street under the yellow, uh, Marcy Road under the little yellow diamond shape with the surrounding buildings around it. Each of these have been inventoried and the blue outlines actually have historic districts, um, whether they be um, national register or just state inventoried. Um, you have to click on each one to find out. Um, and then the, I'm gonna share another version of this, which is the beta version of Macris Maps, because if you do this again, at some point in the very near future, the state is actually gonna release a new version of this website and it will look like this. 
So I want to make sure you see this too, so you get an idea of where it is. So you put in your address. This is the 3 Marcy Street. It's actually 3 Marcy Road. And then it pulls up the inventory form, if there is one. Um, and this can give you a whole lot of information because inventory forms are kind of the primary way that um, historic preservationists record what historic buildings look like um, and what the historic uh, history of a building is at the official state level. So on Google Map, uh, on Macris Maps, we have uh, 3 Marcy Road, which is also called BOS.6047. Uh, that's its official inventory number. And if you click on that link down at the bottom, it brings you back to the original page for Macris where there's a, a basic page of what's been known about it. Um, and then this little blue square on each page brings you actually to the PDF of the inventory form. And that's where things are going to branch in many directions for you as a researcher. Uh, you may actually not find any inventory form and there you're gonna start a little bit behind the game. Um, and we'll show you what to do in that case. But if you have an inventory form, um, then you have at least a good point to start because you're gonna have some data that's been previously recorded. So this is the inventory form for the um, Elijah Jones house. Uh, I'm only showing you the top half of the page because there's nothing else at the bottom. It's a very relatively blank inventory form. You can see there's a lot of notes on it, mostly for in-house use at the state level for the Mass Historical Commission. We, all we have in it is, um, is the address, the estimated date for the late 18th century. I'm gonna show you one more slide, which is a little bit more zoomed in. Um, it might be on the 1831 map, and then the owners is just a list of names based, I can tell, on maps. Having done this enough times, I can see the, the, the dates that have popped up multiple times. You'll see many of these maps soon, too. That's all the state officially has on the Elijah Jones house, and that's where I was at about a year ago when I started all this research, uh, when, I, when I got into the, the bulk of the research for this book, try to figure out what is the story of Three Marcy Road. So this is where I started, and I'm going to show you how I got back to who built the house, because this doesn't even know, it's this late 18th century. Um, and, and we're going to uh, finish this presentation with the story that I wrote in the book about how, uh, about the history of this house. Um, so you'll see kind of how we built upon all of this different data. Um, just to show you a comparison, here's 3 Marcy Road again, uh, the Elijah Jones house on the left, and you can see the three, image, or the three pages of the macros form. Um, and the third page is blank. The first page is, page is mostly boilerplate. As a comparison uh, to this building, which is the Thompson's house, uh, the Thompson house in Charlestown, you can see the extensive amount of information that's already been recorded. So when I wrote up this building, which I think is number, hmm, building number 46 in the book, um, I didn't have much work to do other than resummarize the data that was already presented in the macros form and double check all the dates to make sure they didn't get anything wrong. So if you're researching a house, your own house, someone else's house, um, and you get a five or six page macros form, you, um, you kind of hit the jackpot. You don't have a whole lot of work left to do except read the whole form and enjoy the data. Um, unfortunately for 3 Marcy Road, we had to pretty much start from scratch. So that's what we're gonna do today. So um, once you get past the macros form, the next step is to do your map research. And so I'm gonna share with you two websites that are fantastic that you should use immediately. And if you don't know about them, I'm sorry because you won't be doing anything else tonight but playing on these two websites. Um, the first is mapjunction.com. It is exclusively for Boston. So hooray us. Um, and what it shows us is uh, on the left, you can open up different maps, atlases and aerial images. And on the right, you can turn on different aerial images or other maps. And then the middle part, I don't, I'm not using live websites this evening, but in the middle part, you can move that little green plus sign up and down to increase the opacity of the old map and see um, where different buildings are relative to today. It's been geo-referenced, which is what it's called. So you can actually see what used to be where you are um, and see your building kind of change over time. Um, this is a fantastic resource for uh, especially older maps in Boston because they've all been geo-referenced in here. Um, if you're gonna use the atlases, like the one I have up right now on the page is the 1904 I think it's, yeah, it's a Bromley Atlas. Um, what I actually recommend that you try out is a brand new website that's been released by the Leventhal Map Center. Oh, this is a detailed view, uh, another view of a map junction of the same property in 1904. Um, here's Atlas Scope uh, with the website across the top. You can just Google Atlas Scope. That, this was released in March of this year uh, by the Boston Public Library's Leventhal Map Center um, with many, 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 many maps. Um, and you can see on the right, the drop down of all the different years, I can actually look at this same spot in an atlas from 1933 to 1874. Um, the good thing about Atlas Scope that doesn't that doesn't happen on Map Junction is Atlas Scope includes other towns up to I think Revere. It has Cambridge, Somerville, um, 
uh, Brookline, and I think Newton, but uh, don't quote me on the Newton part. Yeah, Newton, I think, is there too. Uh, so it's a little bit more of the surrounding area that you can look at these atlases. Uh, but these are our three main resources for finding old maps. And the reason why we need the old maps is we need to know who owns the property. So I'm going to go back two slides real fast, and we're going to see what the, how things change over time. So in the 1904 image, um, we have, it's a little bit hard to read, but down at the bottom of it, we have uh, Jones. Um, at the owner, as the owner of this house. Um, here, oh, so this is the same map, good. Um, we have actually A.H. Whitney et al. as the owner of the property. Um, the current property, Free uh, Marcy Road, is located where it says Rosa's ATM Services. And you can see already that in 1904, the house just wasn't where um, it is today. And so um, we believe that the Three Marcy Road actually is one of these two buildings down on River Street. Um, that are owned by A.H. Whitney et al. in 1904. So we write down the date, we write down the owner, we go to another map. Here's one in 1874. This is the oldest map we're going to be able to get of Jacob S. Whitney. And already we can say 1874, we have a Whitney. 1904, we have a Whitney. We probably have somebody living in the Whitney family owning the property for a long time. So that's a good start. And then uh, this goes forward into 1910 and our house has been moved. It's now under this little Whitney uh, building here and our former house location is now this large Victorian style um, probably multifamily with uh, apparently two turrets in the front. So already we're developing a story as to what happened on this property. So other maps that you should be aware of that exist because they're fantastic but they're not on either the Lemethal map um, thing or the, uh, the Atlas scope is uh, two maps in Dorchester from 1831 and 1850 and a Roxbury map from 1832 and 1849. Um, just be aware that they're there. They're available on the Leventhal Map Center's website. Um, you can get a very high, high resolution scan. Um, they're great because they give you, you don't get a lot of detail out of these maps. So what you do is you get a dot on the map and an owner usually. So in this map, we actually see the, the Three Marcy Road being owned by W. Jones. Um, and there's the dot here. Uh, it's a little bit, you have to really know your neighborhood in order to figure out where these dots are on the landscape. But um, take my word for it that that's the Jones house um, there. And then, um, so that's, that gives us the basic maps. And the point of that is to establish owners. So here's what we have by the end of step one, the knowns on the right, the list of all the different owners that we know are owning this house and the year that they own it based on the maps. Now the next step is to connect those dots. So step two, we do deed research. The so deed research will actually tell us who owns the property, who sells it to who and when and how much. Um, but more importantly, with our oldest maps in Boston that really give us that high resolution map, um, the, the Hales maps from the 1870s, we still have in many of the cases of, of uh, Boston's history, another 170 years to go, 140 years to go back um, before we get, or 240 years to go back before we get to uh, 1630s, if we really wanna go all the way back. So um, the only way to really do that is through the deeds. So we're going to talk about next familysearch.org, um, grantor and grantee records, and what happens when you get to dead ends. So you're going to be working, for, in the case of trying to find the oldest part of the building, we're going to be working from our oldest known sites, our oldest known owners, backwards until we reach, hopefully, the owner of the original property back in the day. So but first we have to talk about something real fast. This is a major thing that's gonna have, that's gonna come up if you're doing Boston research. Um, our neighborhoods, many of them started off as their own towns or parts of other towns, and then were accumulated into Boston, usually in the 1900 or 19th century. So that's something that you really have to know. Um, so uh, this is a kind of convoluted page, but I've got the three columns of the different counties that we used to have in Boston. So Suffolk County is all of downtown Boston and every neighborhood after it was annexed to the city. Um, we're going to jump to Middlesex on the far right. Middlesex County included Brighton and Alston as well as Charlestown until they were annexed to the city. Um, very importantly, Brighton was actually part of Cambridge or New Cambridge. So you're going to have Brighton and Alston referred to as Cambridge in old records. Charlestown was its own town from 1629 onward. So it'll be Charlestown. Um, and then even after they accumulate onto Boston, they'll still be referred to by their neighborhood. Norfolk, this is the one that drives me absolutely crazy. So Norfolk as a county did not exist until 1793. The youngest book in this, the youngest building in this book was built in 1794, which means that 
tra tracing the history of every one of these buildings crossed over that Norfolk County line. So anything in a county or a town that was in Norfolk was a big problem for me. So with the creation of Norfolk County in 1793, we have Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan and Hyde Park all in Norfolk County from 1793 until they were annexed in Boston before they were in Suffolk County. So if you're tracing the history of these houses, you're gonna be jumping from county to county in the records and it's kind of a pain in the butt. Um, the other thing to remember is that Roxbury was much, much, much longer, larger than it used to be. Um, so Roxbury includes JP Roslindale, West Roxbury and Roxbury. And during some points in that time, um, places like JP are actually referred to as West Roxbury, not just Roxbury, so that gets really confusing. Um, and then Dorchester was kind of a collective whole, which includes Mattapan, Hyde Park, and the town of Dorchester. So there's a lot of things going on in the different neighborhoods. This I all learned through trial and error. Um, so this, this is something you, if you can print this out someday, you should have it hanging up on your wall just so you don't forget all the dates and changes and everything. All right, so deeds. Deeds are the greatest thing or the biggest pain in the butt known to people if you try to do deed research. And I'm gonna show you how it's done. Every deed in Massachusetts up to the mid 20th century has been scanned and is online for free at familysearch.org. Um, it's a really long web, web address. So every time I use the deeds, I always just Google family search Massachusetts land records and it pops up the link to it. Um, so it's a lot easier to get to. So that's what I recommend people doing. When you get to that first page, you see this pretty blank website that just says family search Massachusetts land records. And then you can browse through the 5.7 million images link um, and that gets you to counties. So this is why we, I did that little thing about the counties. You need to know what county you're actually looking at as you go through. So um, being Boston, we're gonna focus a lot on Suffolk, Norfolk and, um, and uh, Middlesex County. Um, to be completely honest, I haven't checked out a lot of these other links because I don't use them very frequently. So I can't tell you how good the data is on those, but um, Suffolk, Norfolk, and Middlesex are very complete and very well scanned. Um, so that's what the website looks like. We're going to go back to our raw data and see where we need to go. So from our maps, we know that W. Jones owns 3 Marcy Road in 1850 and Jacob S. Whitney owns the property in 1874. That's about a 25 year gap. So as far as I'm concerned, there's too many dates between those two numbers. I'm going to start doing my research at Jacob S. Whitney and work my way backwards, hopefully finding Jones next. And if I don't see Jones next, then I've got another person to add to my list. Most of what I did for the book was really trying to go back to the beginning. So I really focused all of my, a lot of my early efforts on trying to establish how far back I can bring a building, uh, especially for the ones that aren't known. Uh, places like Old North kind of know exactly when that building started. So that's kind of nice. But places like this, you have to start from scratch, literally, or at least from a couple of old maps. Okay, terminology. Grant, uh, deed records are organized by the grantee and the grantor. And the way I remember is a grantee received the property, all the E sounds, and a grantor gave it to uh, somebody. So um, the grantee is the person that bought the house, the grantor is the person that sold the house. And the deed is all the details from the transaction. So based, what that means is that if you have a list of peoples who own the property from your maps, every one of those people is a grantee because they received the property. So you're going to be looking up grantee records to see who they bought it from. So when we click on the Massachusetts land records for, um, in this case, it is Norfolk County. You can tell that because all the dates start in 1793. Um, we have already known Jacob S. Whitney owns the property before 1874. So we go to our grantee list on the left. This is the deed indexes, all organized by the grantees. They're then organized again, the same data as grantors. It's the exact same data backwards. So you're gonna, if you know who sold the property, you go to the grantor documents. If you know who bought the property, you go to the grantee documents. They're all the same. They're just organized backwards to each other. Um, and they're organized by date and then by the last name of the person that bought the house or sold the house. So Whitney, pre-1874, the blue underlined link on the left says 1793 to 1889, therefore, and we're looking for Whitney. So that's the link I'm going to go to, volume 36 and 37, which brings you to a page that looks like this. The one pain about familysearch.org data is that nothing's searchable in the sense that you can't do a search from here. You just have to page through the documents as though you were paging through a book. So you can see how it says image 403 of 478 on the upper left. 
you're going to click through each of those photos or looking for the thing that you're looking the page that you're looking for. So they're organized with the date of the sale on the left, and then they have the grantee column, the grantor column, the town where the data was found, or where the date, where the sorry, where the house was sold, um, the book of the deed, the page of the deed, Libris folio, um, the instrument, meaning what kind of document is it? And you're going to be mostly looking for the ones that say deed, because that's the actual sale of the property. You'll see things like MTG, that's the mortgage. They're not actually selling or buying the house; they're selling the ownership technically, but the person's probably still standing there. Uh, staying there. So you really want to look up deeds because those will tell you who's owning what. And then there'll be a description of the property. This can be a pain in the butt. And I'm going to show you the next slide, which is actually the same page. Just scroll down a little bit further because we're on the right page for Jacob Whitney. You see Jacob at the bottom of this page. So here's Jacob Whitney's purchases. Um, it could be a bunch of different Jacob S. Whitney's. They're all going to get listed the same, but this is probably the same guy. Um, and you can see down here on 1859, May 4th, there's a document, I'm sorry, one more down, 1860, November 16th, Edmund P. Tileston and others sold the property to Jacob S. Whitney in Dorchester on book 293, page 228. It's a deed. And the description is the road from Mattapan to Dedham. So this is before River Street actually got its official name. Um, down in the next line, you actually see a mortgage on a property that's described as River Street, two parcels. Um, just to cut to the chase, that's actually the same property. And in the same year, 1860, the property went from being the road from Mattapan to Dedham to, the, to River Street. So you kind of have to know your maps really well to know, okay, what would the road from Dedham to Mattapan look like? Oh, it's the Southern East West Road, that's River Street. Okay, I know I need to look for the road from Mattapan to Dedham. And unfortunately, a lot of this is just through trial and error, but I'll show you a resource in a second that'll give you some information about how to look up these dates. So once you know a property, uh, Jacob Whitney, Edmund Tileston, this looks like it's the right one. Sometimes you'll end up with 15 or 20 deeds that could be the right one, and you have to look up each one of them. Um, this is why it took me about two years to research this book, because some of them took days and days of deed research to get to the point where I could say, oh, this is definitely the building, and usually hit a couple of dead ends. Um, so you write down the book in the page, and then you go to read the actual deed, which brings you back to that main column with the grantors, the grantees, has all of your deeds. We look up the volume 293, there's the 1860 deed. Um, and real fast, I just want to point out, see how it says volume 293-294? That actually means that you have two different books together in that same post. So what that means is as you're scrolling through, your, scrolling through the books that you're looking at, and you really want 293, you might actually be looking at 294. And there's been many times that I've been doing the research and then on the correct page and the data is not there only to realize that I'm in the second half or the first half of the document and I'm in the wrong volume, if that makes any sense. Um, so that's a little bit of a, of a pain if you end up doing a lot of page thumbing just to find out you're in the wrong spot. So here's our deed, 293. I'm not going to read a, a deed at you all because I don't hate you. Um, and you can see on the right that it says Tileston to Whitney. You know you're in the right place. So that's great. Um, and I did a little summary on the right here. The left page is the deed. It's actually a really short deed. Usually they're a lot longer. Um, the, essentially, all of that boilerplate boils down to Edmund Tileston, um, Amer, uh, Hollingsworth, they're selling the property to Jacob Whitney. They paid $1,100. It includes lands and the building, and that's really important if you're trying to figure out when the building was built, because if it just says the land and not the building, there's a good chance that you, they bought undeveloped land, which could be the start of your house, which is interesting. Um, all the neighbors are listed, which is really great, and all the boundaries of the property are described, as well as it's saying it's about an acre. Um, neighbors are really important because if you get stuck, the way to get past getting stuck in the deeds is to actually do the neighbors research. And so if you can't go back any further, maybe you can go back on the neighboring property to an earlier sale and then have them describe their neighbors, which will be your property that you're looking up, and maybe you'll get a new owner out of that. Um, there's a lot of ways to, to skin this cat, unfortunately. <laughs> All right, so you do everything, uh, you keep doing that with your deeds until you go back to essentially someone saying, I bought a lot of land, instead of saying, I bought a lot of land and a house. And that's usually telling you that the house is built. Now, there could be multiple houses that they're selling over time. So that's one of the challenges. You have to kind of know your styles of houses to know whether or not you're dealing with the same house every time it sells or if they're putting up a new one. That's one of the hard things about this research is that you can't always tell. Um, I'll show you the street book in a second that will help you understand the street history a little bit better. And then for me, I always do a sketch of the, of the property boundaries with the neighbors because as I'm going through the deeds, they tend to be the same um, description of the property. And you can check your drawing to see, oh, is this the same property or not? Yeah, it definitely is. Um, and then also you can track down the neighbors if you have to. 
I always Google my results as I go. So in this case, I'm doing my research. I see um, uh, Tileston and Hollingsworth and Dorchester come up. I don't know who these people are. I throw them in Google and next thing you know, I have some very obvious paper mill industry connections. So that's really exciting. I do a lot of research on that. You're gonna hear about the results of that, but that's a nice little avenue of research to figure out, well, why is Tileston and Hollingsworth buying a tiny little house on the edge of Mattapan um, when their mills are huge and nearby? So that's one of the questions that I now have a research question from it's three Marcy Road and it might be 18th century. Here's a book that uh, you'll get a link to in a little bit. Um, that is a directory of all the cities, uh, all the streets in Boston pre-1910. And what it has is uh, you can look up different streets and figure out what they used to be called and also what they, uh, what their distance or where they start and end. Um, this is really helpful. Unfortunately, this one for River Street and Dorchester doesn't say this. The street used to be called the road from Mattapan to Dorchester um, or Mattapan to Denham. In a lot of cases, you'll actually see that uh, the old names of these streets will be listed for each one of them. Um, so River Street says this was laid out in 1840. It's a 17th century road, it's actually a native trail. Um, so what that really means is that somebody said this is officially River Street and we're gonna mark it officially in 1840 as opposed to there being a trail or an old road that would have been there from the 1600s forward. Um, but this is a really great reference if you need to get more data on different streets. All of it free. Um, the worst thing about deeds is that almost inevitably you're going to get stuck. Um, so here's the types of ways that you might get stuck and to be ready if you see it. Um, if a property is sold by a town, they don't actually sell it in the name of Dorchester or in Boston or Roxbury. They actually sell it in the name of the selectman on the town's board. What that means is that you might actually be buying it from a whole bunch of white dudes, but you actually bought it from Roxbury. And that's how it's going to get recorded in the in the record. So if you're looking for a, an owner, say a town, that you know that the property was sold from the town of Dorchester to an owner. What you're going to actually do is you're going to have to look up who the select people are in Dorchester, select men usually, um, and figure out what their names are. And you might have to look them up, and that can get really troubling over time. Um, the uh, multiple owners may be listed independently, meaning the Tileston may have his own listing and Hollingsworth might have his own listing. And maybe they didn't duplicate everything in the same data for each one. So if you can't find one of the owners, go after the other one if there's multiple people selling the property at once. Um, there's sometimes missing data, spellings of names can get really weird. Um, for me, I'm always in the wrong county um, for Norfolk and, and Suffolk counties, especially wrong book, which is what I told you earlier about you went for 293 and you accidentally ended up in 294 and you did all the page searching and found out you were in the wrong book. Um, sometimes you get a really great, uh, you have the right page, but it's scanned too dark and you can't read it. Um, that happened a couple of times where I knew I was looking at the right page and I could see like five words, but everything else was gone. The war happened, the Revolutionary War. Um, that's a real big pain in the butt because if, you're per if your house is owned by a Tory and they abandoned their property and the state confiscated it, you might not have a sale record of when the house was bought and sold from about 1760 to 1790 or so, because what's actually happening is it's getting confiscated by the government and then auctioned. So you may not actually see all those records come up. And then I found that crossing over the war turns into a black hole hole for deed research because sometimes you, you just lose the property and the deeds. Um, and in almost every case, the solution for losing the property is to follow the neighbors because they will have more details, hopefully. Um, I've definitely done a lot of work in Lower Mills for deed research for this book. And I, I swear to God, I know every owner of every property in Lower Mills because I've had to deal with so many neighboring researchers or neighboring properties to be able to get to the, a, a billion dead ends in this book. Um, it shows up as a three page written document, but sometimes those three pages took almost a week of research to get to that point. So. I um, hope you enjoy it in the end. <laughs> um, so here's two of the dead ends that I reached on Marcy Road. I have an owner named John McLean, but he doesn't buy the property. No records of him buying this property in the, in the grant tour record or grantee records as the person who got it. So that's a problem. Also, at one point, I find out that Mass General Hospital owns three Marcy Road, a tiny little house in Mattapan. Yeah, I didn't get that either. Um, so those are two things that I couldn't justify. And more importantly, I'm at a dead end. And I think it's like 1830. John McLean owns the property and I got stuck, really stuck for weeks. I couldn't figure out how to get around it um, because, and I knew I was probably about 70 years 
away from figuring out when this house was built. And so there's gonna be a lot of owners before John McLean, but I couldn't figure out how to get past that. So the next step, once you get done with your deeds, is to do probates and wills. If you can't find it in the deed, what I found out is that more than likely, it's because somebody died and gave it to them in a will. And that's what we're gonna do next. So the two sites we're gonna talk about next is Ancestry.com, which many of you are familiar with, and Family Search again, um, because they have everything. So here's Ancestry.com's will and probate rec records. Um, you just Google Ancestry.com probates and it pops up. Um, probates are more of a general term that includes things like wills, inventories, that kind of thing. Um, and then right now, because uh, the library is closed, the library version of Ancestry.com, if you have a library card, is free and online and you can access it remotely. So if you don't have an Ancestry.com account, right now you can actually use it from home with your library card, which is really exciting. Um, if you don't have an Ancestry.com account, use the family search, which is a free version. It's just a lot more work to get to it. In this case, you can put in the first and last name of the person on Ancestry and pop up their will if it's there, but it doesn't include all of the information. I'll show you what I mean in a second. So um, here's the familysearch.org page. Uh, for the Massachusetts probate, there's each one, each county has a different page, so you'll get the links to that. They're organized by um, by index and then dockets and then the actual book. So the probate index is where we're going to start. That's where you only know the person's name and you can see all 200 years are included in one document. In the probate index, you go by name. So there's our John McLean's. We're looking for John McLean. Um, you can see him kind of center list and you can see all the McLean's from 17, whatever, 93 to 1920 something um, listed. And, uh, and then a, what the probate is, and then a number afterwards. You can see down at the bottom, there's John 1823, his will, and it's number 27092. So you write down all that information, and then you go back to your original, uh, to the previous page, this one here, um, and you scroll down a little bit to the probate docket. So this is the docket numbers, and we're looking for 27,092. And there it is in probate docket number 23600 to 28799, 1811 to 1830. This is really exciting, isn't it? Um, so then you click on that link and then you get to the actual inventory of all of the different people that are in that previous book. So that, that one line is now actually this page and another page because John McLean had some crazy stuff happen with his will. They're never this long. You can see above John McLean, there's an Elizabeth Kilton. That's usually what these things look like. I'm gonna zoom in a bit so you can actually read some of this. Um, so the first couple of lines of all of these things are gonna be what you really wanna see. And you can see the main ones that we really want is the will, because that actually says what they own and who they're giving it to. Another one to always look for as an archeologist, I love them, is the inventory. You're really lucky the inventory can be a room by room account of everything that they have in the house. And I didn't get to write about it a lot in the book, but there's one, um, this guy named Cheever, I could draw you, a, I could photograph every object from a museum and put it together into one big collage of everything that this guy owned because they describe it to the point where I know what types of ceramic his dishes were made out of, um, which makes my heart go pitter patter because I like old stuff. Um, so that's great for the inventory. Sometimes the inventory literally just says we took an inventory, which isn't very really helpful, but the will is what you're really going to want to see. And then um, you'll see on the right, I can't quite see it in my view, you'll see the page, the book and the page of the will. And then you go back to your familysearch.com or .org things and you scroll down a little bit past the dockets and then you get to the actual records. There's volume 121 from 1823. These are all the people that died in 1823 and their records that are there. And here we go, John McLean's will, 27092. It's a very, very long will. John McLean is loaded. There's a lot of details in there, but that's how you get the actual line by line um, uh, itemized will. Uh, so in this case, we know that John McLean owns the property, but we're not sure really where he got it. And we're not really sure how um, Mass General got the will either, or got the property either. Um, so what we need to do is figuring out, we, the um, going back one, uh, Mass General is actually in John McLean's will where he's giving the property to um, Mass General, and you'll see how in a second. Um, but we don't know where John McLean got it, so we have to do a little bit of genealogy. Um, it's all going to get tied back to everything. Um, and in this case, we were able to use Ancestry.com to figure out that John McLean's dad is the name is Hugh McLean. And then I went back to Hugh McLean's will from 1800 through the same technique that I just showed you. And you can see in here that he's giving all of my other estate I give to my said wife and my son. So I now know that his estate went to his wife and John McLean. 
So at least I now can think, oh, maybe the property is actually bought by Hugh McLean, not John McLean. And that's why I couldn't find Hugh, uh, John buying the property. So then we go back and do all the deed research. And then turns out that Hugh McLean actually did buy the property. And I'll, I'll, I have a summary of all the data at the end that you'll see where, uh, where it came from and where it went. So this is how the wills tie into all of the uh, ownership because sometimes it's just not in the deeds. So we go back to the deeds and here's a, uh, a deed from, which one is this? This is Elijah Jones selling of the property to Hugh McLean in 1786 in the Norfolk County Deeds, book 158, page 148. And then previously we see another uh, record that says that Elijah Jones is buying a vacant land from the town of Dorchester, which isn't actually Dorchester. It's a whole bunch of people. Um, so you can see on that, uh, the, the deed that I'm showing in this actual presentation, you see that says clap, a whole bunch of squiggly lines and a whole bunch of other words that we can't see to Jones. That clap is actually one of the selectmen. And you can see on the left, Noah Clapp, John Minot, Ebenezer Willington, Samuel uh, something, Ezekiel Tolman. Those are all the selectmen of Dorchester. So they're selling the property to Jones, not Dorchester, although technically it is Dorchester. So that's where things get a little weird. Yeah, um, so now we're still in deeds, uh, but that's how we've gotten to figure out when the property could have been built because Eliza Joan is buying vacant land from the town of Dorchester. He's also a house right, which is pretty interesting because that means that he probably built the house himself. And through all of this research, we now have a pretty good picture of what's going on at the house. And I'll kind of read my summary in a minute. One thing I didn't do for this house, but is really important for places like the North End and any place where you have a high density of people living in apartments or tenements is to go through the tax records because they're incredibly important. Uh, FamilySearch.org, again, has all of them scanned, um, 1822 to 1918, and the earlier ones from 1780 to 1821 are all on the Boston Public Library. So why do the tax records matter? If you're dealing with an apartment, so anybody doing research in the 19th century, especially near downtown, odds are if you're looking up somebody or the owner of a property, they're not necessarily the person living in the property. So my ancestors were all immigrants, so I'm looking up data about them. I need to find out, um, knowing who owned the apartment isn't gonna tell me anything about the people in the house. And if I'm doing archeology span on a site, I need to know who is in the house and I get that from the tax records, but I'm more concerned about who's leaving the stuff behind, not who owns the house. Um, so that's the main reason. The problem with tax records is that they're extremely biased data. So they're only taking information from adult men which means if you're a woman, for the most part, you're not getting recorded in the tax records. And for the most part, children are not there. It's always, there's a million exceptions, but for the most part, you're only gonna find adult men living in these houses. So they could be married and have 45 kids, we've never seen them in the taxes. So what do those look like? Here's the um, page on familysearch.org. You Google Boston tax records. Um, there's three different types, the assessor's list, the tax books and the valuation book. So what we're doing today, where you're just looking up who lives in the house, skip the assessors and the tax books, look only at the valuation books. I'm, I don't really know the differences, but just take my word for it. It's the valuation books. When you're looking at this, it's the far column on the right. Um, and I usually forget which one's the important one. So the first time I do the tax records, I usually look up the assessors and then the tax and go, oh, it's the valuation books. Um, they're all organized by ward, which is hard. The way to find a ward is tricky. So what I do is I go to map junction, and this is an overlay of, I think, an 1810 map, or 1848 map. There we go. I wrote it right on there. Um, some of the maps that show the entire downtown area of Boston will have kind of subtle numbers on the page, and you can see it with the red arrows, one, two, three, four, whatever, you know, numbers. Um, those are actually the wards. So if I'm doing research around Old North, which I usually am because I've dug, I think, everything on Old North at this point, um, around Old North, um, that's almost always in Ward 1, although the North End changes to another ward later on. But So you use these maps that are online to get an idea about what ward you're looking in because the tax books are organized by ward. And sometimes it takes a really long time just to figure out what ward you're in by doing a lot of um, uh, uh, pointless searching um, through the valuation books, and sometimes it just takes forever. Um, a lot of the textbooks will actually have uh, in the first pages a list of streets and then the pages are and then the street numbers. So um, if I'm looking up number four causeway, I know that it's in Ward 1 now and um, or I'm sorry, backing up. I know that in Ward 1, Causeway Street is on page four. Charter Street, because it's enormous, is on all bunch of other pages. Charlestown Street is on page six. And then I can just go to those pages and see, find my address based on the owner, since I know the owner. 
and they're always listed. So here's a page from the tax records. On the right side is the owners. On the left side is who's actually there. So you can see that sometimes it's the same owner and the occupier. Um, John Beard is the owner and he also lives there. But you'll see a whole bunch of names of people that don't own the buildings that actually live there. So those are your people in your house uh, as you're going through back through time. Um, they'll also give you uh, what they did as a job, what street they're living on, and the value of their real estate and personal um, uh, information. I believe that if you know a person, we're doing this based on buildings, so this is organized by street. I believe that one of those tax books is actually organized by person. So if you know somebody that lives in Boston, you can use a tax record, look them up by name, and then see where they lived, kind of the backwards version of what we're looking at. But since this is a building thing, we're going to talk mostly about valuations. Um, the earlier ones from 1780 to 1821, um, those early tax records are on the Boston Public Libraries page. And you can see, again, it's still organized by Ward, um, 1780, Ward 1. Um, and so you can go all the way back to 1780. And what that gives you is really good information about 18th century owners of properties and what their values were, um, even if they're renting properties, which is really hard to do uh, usually in research. Okay. Last but not least, the directories. That's going to give you a lot of information about who's living where and what they're doing. Um, and the Tufts directory has a search function where you can actually look up by year, by the person's name or the address and see what they, who they are and where they're living. Okay, I'm running really bad on time, so I'm going to finish up. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to read a chapter from the book as the final part. So when I started the process of the Elijah Jones house, I didn't know it was called the Elijah Jones house. All I knew is that it was on Three Marcy Road. It was about 1770. And this, from the research that went into this book, this is what I found out about it. In March of 1777, house right Elijah Jones purchased one and three quarters acres of undeveloped pasture from the town of Dorchester on the north side of what would become River Street in Mattapan. He liked to build the house himself. By 1786, the property was divided into two parcels, one one-acre parcel that contained a house and other buildings, and a smaller three-quarter acre parcel that contained the blacksmith shop of Elijah's brother, Thomas. It is likely that Elijah built both structures sometime during the revolution, but given the height of the activities and the need for the raw materials during the time, the house is estimated to have been built towards the end of the war, since both the deeds of Jones's original purchase of the lot and his sale of the building were filed on the same day in 1786, nearly 10 years after Jones first bought the property, suggesting that there was some delay in building his property. So he bought it and sold it 10 years apart, but filed the paperwork on the same, in the same day, suggesting there could have been a pretty good delay. Architecturally, the house Elijah Jones built is gambled roof with a single story, finished attic, and is modest overall in scale. It's one of the smallest buildings included in this book and only three bays or openings wide, has a central doorway with three likely later window openings in its gambrel roof and has a central chimney that has almost certainly been greatly reduced in size. Most importantly, it did not start its life on Marcy Street. The mills immediately to the south of this house drew multiple investors and businesses to the area. One of these was the paper making factory on the Neponset owned by Hugh McLean and James Boys. Hugh McLean was an early Irish immigrant to Boston area and would eventually purchase both of the property lots from Jones in 1786, as well as numerous larger parcels along River Street, west of what would later be Mattapan Square. You see Mattapan Square on the map on the left. This, the blue triangle is one of those buildings is the building that we're looking at, although none of them quite look like it. And then you can see the Neponset River with all of the mill buildings, including number 10 down here. And then early paper making on the right in the 18th century. In Hugh McLean's 1800 will, he left his entire estate to his wife, Agnes, and son, John McLean. John McLean became a wealthy Boston merchant who grew up in Milton and had his primary office on Long Wharf near building number 26 in the book. McLean is credited for placing six mile markers in Milton and Dorchester that mark the distance from, uh, of the markers to Boston. All six Milton markers and one of the Dorchester markers on Blue Hill Avenue were made standing today. Upon McLean's death in 1821, he left behind a massive estate and a will that led to a large legal battle. In this will, McLean's estate was valued at over $200,000, a fortune that would today be valued in the millions. He left his wife $35,000 as well as his, as his Charles Bullfinch designed house on Beacon Hill. He also left a large sum of money to Harvard University to fund a professor of ancient and modern history chair. This funded chair, the McLean Professor of Ancient and Modern History is still active today 
The position is currently occupied by Emma Dench, who studies Roman history and is also Dame Judi Dench's niece. Didn't think she was going to come up in this book. McLean also left large sums of money to Mass General Hospital, MGH, and the world-renowned McLean Hospital, a psychiatric facility in Belmont, is named in his honor. McLean left $50,000 to Jonathan and Francis Amory, who were tasked with investing the money in a safe investment, with the proceeds then going to John's wife upon her death. The remaining funds were then to be divided evenly between Harvard and Mass General. In 1828, the later surviving Emory Francis resigned from the trustees when the funds were to be distributed to Harvard and MGH. When the funds were distributed, both sued Amory. Harvard and MGH claimed that the funds he had was tasked with investing had lost value and that therefore the funds were not safely invested, but done with speculation and negligence. The case ended up in the Mass General Supreme Court, where Amory was actually found not liable for the losses, but the court clarified that although investments can lead to losses, money and trust should not be invested speculatively, which is a far greater risk of loss. This became known as the prudent man rule, which is actually taught in law schools today over this property, which essentially states that when money and trust does not specifically include which types of investments are permitted, the trust must act as a prudent man would invest their own property, including keeping in mind the needs of those who will receive the funds, the overall preservation of the estate, and the revenue that would be produced with the income. If you're wondering where the Elijah Jones house comes into this, McLean's estate also included the land he inherited to his father in Dorchester. The land was originally meant to go to John Boyes, the son of James Boyes, Hugh McLean's business partner, but James died, resulting in the Mass General Hospital becoming the sole owner of the tiny Elijah Jones house in Mattapan. The hospital did not have much use for it, so in 1824, MGH sold the house to Amasa Fuller, another papermaker. In Amasa Fuller's 1826 will, he states that the house and the land he, uh, he's selling to be placed, or that after he dies, to be placed in trust with Thomas Crehor, a card maker, and Henry Gardner, with the proceeds of the rental or sale of the property to go uh, within three years of sale to benefit Amasa's wife, and with a third of those proceeds to go to Crehor and Gardner's as trustees. Thomas Crehor was a well-known early playing card manufacturer with factories on River Street in Mattapan. He's said to have worked at James Boise's mill, who also was with John McLean, um, sorry, Hugh McLean, and lived with him on Curtis Road in Milton, just up the river from the house. Henry Gardner married into the Clapp family of Dorchester and would eventually become the state treasurer of Massachusetts. His son would become the 23rd governor of Massachusetts. Freehor and Gardner also ch uh, chose to sell the house in 1827 to Isaac and Caroline Bowen, who raised their daughter in the house. In 1845, Isaac's sole child, Caroline, married Woodman Jones, a cabinet maker who was trained in cabinet making in Dorchester by George Haynes, who's also the owner of building number 37 in the book. It's possible that Woodman is related to Elijah Jones because they both share the same last name, the man who built the house, but Woodman was born in Maine and we're not quite sure actually the relationship. The property passed from Amasa to his daughter Caroline and it remained in the Bowens Jones family until 1847 when it sold to Edmund Tileston, Charles Tileston, and his nephew Mark Hollingsworth the owners of the Tileston and Hollingsworth paper mills. This transaction included the description of the properties having both a house and a cabinet shop, shop with outbuildings. Tileston and Hollingsworth purchased the McCarthy and Leeds mill in 1831 in Mattapan, and their descendants carried on the manufacturing of book paper in, mill, in the mills, as well as the Eagle paper mill. I'm sorry, this is a um, 19th century paper making. Um, they also own the Eagle Paper Mill at the, on Center Street Bridge near the Neponset River on Lower Mills, today the site of a Walgreens pharmacy. The partners were major landowners in Mattapan economy, uh, Mattapan's economic and social center. They rent, retained ownership of the house and the shop, likely renting out both until 1860 when they sold the property to Joseph Whitney, whose family were all millwrights. Joseph Whitney lived and worked on the property until 1906 when he sold the property for a dollar. The following year, Marcy Street, then called Whitney Park, was laid out on the eastern edge of the property, and it appears that this triggered the move of the house from River Street to 3 Marcy Street. Though it is now covered in vinyl siding and the chimney is much reduced, likely during the move, the house overall retains its 18th century appearance. With a deep lean-to addition on the rear, it is possibly that it's probable that the move saved the house. Placing it on the road with similar sized, modest single family home, homes that have not yet seen the pressures for redevelopment on the dead end side street. 
The place where the house used to stand first, uh, first saw the addition of a large multifamily home with two rounded turrets on its front, the Victorian house that we showed earlier. But that was demolished in the mid 20th century. And today the property is vacant land owned by the city of Boston. And I'd really like to do a dig there. Um, the Elijah Jones house is an, incredibly, is an incredible building with a great history. It is not currently a Boston landmark or listed on the National Register. It actually has no historic designations. Uh, but fortunately, there are few th threats to its preservation at the moment. So well, that's how we get all that information from nothing. So thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I really appreciate that you stuck it through to the end. Um, I hope you guys asked some questions and Aaron can help kind of get those to me. Um, but other than that, thank you all for being here tonight and I, I hope to have some good questions. Great, thank you, Joe. Um, your lecture really gives us a fantastic foundation for how to do this kind of research um, on older buildings and certainly whets our appetite um, for your book that's coming out next spring. Um, now I would like to open the program up for questions. We've gotten some already. Um, as they come to you, please type them into the chat box and I'm going to try to consolidate if there are any that are similar and then I'll ask them to Joe. Um, there were a few that came in very early on um, one is just a simple question. Does Atlas Scope map Arlington? I don't believe that Arlington's currently included. I believe they're actively adding Bromley maps to it. Um, I don't, I know that somebody from uh, Leventhal was saying that they might have some people here tonight. So maybe if somebody knows the answer to that or if it's coming, um, can add it to the chat. But I don't believe it's one of the ones currently on there, but check it out. Um, uh, I'm almost positive that it isn't on there. I think the furthest west it goes is Milton. I mean, um, not Milton, um, Newton. All right, thank you. Um, another simple, straightforward question. Are there ever maps or plans associated with these deeds in registry records? Those are the greatest Easter eggs if you find one known to people. Um, so yes, there are. Um, the problem with the plans is that they tend to just do the outline of the property. So you might get the shape, the size, and some of the really nice angles of what it looks like. And you can compare that to the uh, um, to the, the maps that we have from the Bromleys, especially the Atlases. Um, very rarely you'll get a building actually drawn on the property. Um, those are the best kind to find. Um, we just did a dig over the winter where we actually not only had the building drawn in, but we had the outhouse mapped in in beautiful detail, which was fantastic because that allowed us to see where, where the outhouse was. And we love digging outhouses, so we went straight for it. Um, but for the most part, you're really only going to get text. I would say out of the entire book, I probably looked at 200 deeds at least, and I'd say maybe two maps total out of all of those. So they're really rare. Um, in fact, when you're scanning through the pages and one even comes up, it's worth looking at just because it's kind of nice to see them when they do show up. They're just, they're that rare. Do you use census data in any of your research or does it not go back in time far enough? So the census for me works out really well in the 19th century. Again, when you're looking for people who are living in the house that are not, are not owning the house. The problem with the census is that it's every 10 years. Um, so you really miss a lot of people, especially in really high turnover areas like the North End, the West End, uh, South End, where people are moving quickly and you might miss people. The one thing that the census does that the tax records don't do is you get the women and children, which you otherwise don't get in the tax records. So it fills in a gap for that one year every 10 years. So unfortunately, you kind of have to do the math to figure out is this person even alive between the census? Um, so, and you miss children that may have passed away too. Um, so yeah, the tax records is a much more higher resolution year by year, but the census record is a much more in-depth picture of that year. And then the other thing that's challenging is that I've never found a tax record and a census record from the same year that 100% agreed with each other. Um, which just to add to the flavor of fun so I come up doing this research. Yeah. They're usually the same people for the most part, but there's always extra people or missing people in one or the other. Um, okay, so another, this is a, a juicy one about the research that you do. When it comes to dead ends and the records, does anything stand out as your greatest challenge and or accomplishment and how did you work around it? So one of the reasons why you're hearing about Three Marcy Road is that um, I walked away from that building after probably two solid days of work, um, gave up in the end with the John McLean thing. Um, it, it seems like it was obvious now, but it wasn't at the time that he had inherited the property. Um, but that's where I really got stuck. And then the next thing I found after him was all this cool stuff about 
Mass General, and it just seemed really interesting. So for me, getting over that hump was probably the hardest challenge that I found in the book um, from the research point of view. There was a whole lot of buildings that got stuck, but um, and they just took a lot of walking away and coming back later to go try. Anyone that's done the ancestry research knows that there's a lot of times we just need to walk away and then come back later with fresh eyes. Um, but yeah, for me, the getting Marcy Street, not only, not only did we get Marcy Street back to a date that's approximately the right date for when it was built, to be able to say that, that um, Abijah, or, oh my gosh, Elijah Jones, um, who's a house right, probably built the house. Uh, most buildings, we don't even know who built them. And in this case, we ended up not only with a year that he probably could have bought or built the house, but to know that he's a house right and we have a name of the person that probably built the house. That was pretty big. Um, so that was a really nice way to end the research on that house was to know for a fact that it was a vacant lot and bought by a house right then that's a pretty good smoking gun for when the property was built. Now, how did you know that it that it was a, a historic house if it wasn't marked as historic? Yeah, one, I don't know who recorded it, but somebody wrote that really short form in the masses and macros. Um, it wasn't on my radar. I drive by it on my way to the lab every day. Um, well, not anymore, but I used to. Um, and uh, that building I never noticed. And when I did the research for this book, I was able to go to Macris and basically just copy down all of the old dates and arrange them in order and Marcy Street turned up. If somebody happened to say, I think this is 1770, the weird part is that not all the other houses in the area are recorded. So it feels kind of like they knew something about it and I don't know who recorded it or how they got it, but they did. That also means that there's probably other three Marcy roads out there that are hiding, again, in plain sight that, that I missed. Um, there's a couple of the houses in this book that I personally found. Uh, one of them's on Tileston Street and Hanover Street um, called the Grant House. Um, nobody had really searched that one. I walked by it after taking a picture of Old North and the clubhouse and, and this, um, not this house, another house in the property. Um, I walked by and I saw a belt course, which is almost always an 18th century architectural feature. And I was like, holy cow, that house has got to be 18th century. Did the deed research and I was able to get it back to, I think, the 1750s. But that house wasn't on, on any record as going past, I think, 1810. So, um, yeah, but I think that this book is the 50 oldest that I can figure out right now. But I'm not doubting for a second that we're going to have to, we're, there's going to be a couple of asterisks where it's like that house wasn't as old as you thought it was. And these five houses are definitely older than, than we thought. Um, the only way to test a house for sure is to do dendrochronology, where you actually look at the tree ring growths. And that gives you an idea of how, when the house was actually, the wood was cut down. So that's about as close as we can get to a date. Um, but that just tells you when the tree was cut, not when the house was built. So um, do you ever have to go to an archive in person and look at paper resources because you're looking for information that, is, that has not been digitized yet? Um, not, not a lot. Um, some of the records I do, uh, every once in a while I'll see a, a map in a, or mentioned in a deed that says, oh, this property is recorded by the so-and-so in a map. And then in one case, we had that turn up at the Bostonian Society or Revolutionary Spaces. Um, but for the most part in Boston, and I'm, that's a big asterisk because I know many people that don't have the resources that have been digitized in Boston that we all do. Um, but for the most part, I don't have to do um, in-person research for what I'm doing. Um, I would say that I didn't in all reality, I didn't have to go to an in-person place to do the research for this book. Wow. Yeah, that's how good the, the, the resources are right now, um, which is great because I did the bulk of the writing in March, so I couldn't go anywhere anyway. So if I needed to get more data, I had to look it up here, um, downstairs actually, but uh, yeah. That's incredible. Um, I don't see any other questions uh, coming in. So everybody, if you're thinking of anything, now's your last chance. Um, I want to use this time to actually plug our next program. Oh, okay, we have one last question. How many of the 50 houses have you been able to enter? What do you find? Um, four, <laughs> not many of them. Um, I'm not talking a lot about interiors. The only ones I really talk about interiors are the churches because we've got good photos of them, um, but not many, not many at all. Um, many of them are privately owned. Um, I think a couple of home homeowners are gonna be finding their house in a book and not realizing that they were written up about. Um, I don't think the three Marcy Road person has any idea that they live in the 36th oldest house in Boston. Um, I never went up there and knocked on the door. I didn't feel, I'm not a very, um, despite my talks and what I do, I'm not a very outgoing person like that. And I think I'd rather die than knock on the door and tell somebody something like that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> But 
yeah, I think it's something that, uh, yeah, so most of the buildings are, are now open to the public. Um, so that's actually, that question is actually a good segue um, into what I was about to tell everybody, which is about our program next week. Um, I will actually be giving a webinar on the Clough House, um, which is a historic home that's in your upcoming book, um, but it's on the back of Old Norris property. And um, we recently had an exhibit on this house uh, that, that took place in the house, largely based on research from Joe um, from the 2013 archaeological dig that he conducted. Um, so I will send that link out um, in the follow-up email to everybody. I would love to invite all of you to participate in that because um, we'll actually be showing some really cool uh, images of that house. Um, and you, you can, this, this is one of the historic homes you, you can actually enter usually. Um, unfortunately, the Clough House will not be reopening when uh, the rest of the site reopens because it is so small. Um, so with all of social distancing and spacing, spacing requirements, we won't be able to have it op be open. So this webinar is your way to um, get to see inside the house and learn about its really interesting history. Um, so that is actually next Tuesday, same time at 7 p.m. Um, and with that, I'll go ahead and conclude the program tonight. Thank you again for choosing to engage with us. As I mentioned at the opening, this kind of public programming is only made possible by the generous contributions of participants like you. Um, it, it almost goes without saying, but due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, Old North, like many museums and historic sites, is facing critical funding concerns. If you are able to, please consider making an additional donation tonight to support our ongoing education and preservation work. That link is again in the chat box. Also, you can help uh, Old North by purchasing books or other fabulous gift items from our online gift shop. We actually have a fantastic Independence Day collection that I'm linking to in the chat box as well. If you wanna buy anything for your loved ones or something for you to do over the long weekend, your support is enormously helpful at this time um, and it will help sustain us in the coming weeks and months. So thank you, thank you. Uh, and finally, thank you to the intrepid Joe Bagley. Your work has an immeasurable impact on the history, preservation, and archaeology fields, both academic and public. And we look forward to your second book, which we will be selling in our gift shop in spring of 2021. So for all of you who will be waiting for it, please purchase it from Old North. Um, thank you again. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Wonderful presentation. Thank you. Yeah.